China. China. Here I'm looking at how state-controlled Chinese film seeks better international grounding, and how pro-Chinese sentiment is finding its way into mainstream Western film. China offers a lucrative and risky consumer market to Hollywood executives, but it also has a strong domestic industry, and, it seems, aspires for a far more potent international audience. The Chinese box office brought in $8.9 billion in 2018. That's only $3 billion behind US numbers. You can see instantly why that makes it important. For greater context, that's the same size as the US market was in about 2005 or 6. Incidentally, also the same time that analysts were saying the Chinese market would overtake the US market in about 2018. Go figure. Domestic films made up about 62% of that 8.9 billion, a significant gain over the 54% of the 8.6 billion made in 2017. But growth continued to slow in 2018, especially when you realise state statisticians have been fiddling the reporting a little bit for quite a while. US studio offerings saw a 16.5% financial decline in China in 2018, yet a record-breaking year overall. Of the top five box office performers in China, only one isn't Chinese-made. The fifth one, Avengers Infinity War. Like kiwi fruit, like beard. So they're wondering... Are like you a kiwi fruit? Like adorable kiwi fruit. <laughs> or... Here's the weird truth of the Chinese market. As I see it, if they let anything play there, they could be, fairly easily, the biggest market in the world. But they can't or they won't. China is an autocracy. Its media and arts limbs aren't just there to facilitate profit, but also control. If you look at what the non-Avengers films were, you might be fooled into thinking the Chinese market isn't so different to the US. It's dominated by light stuff, fun stuff, disposable stuff. <laughs> But all of those films are heavily regulated and censored, as is the market. For a foreign film to get distribution in China, it has to be approved. So what we need to understand is that when we talk about the Chinese market, we're not just talking about what Chinese people want to go and see. We're also talking about what the Chinese government will allow them to see and encourage them to see. Approval gates are an effective way of influencing film producers who are outside of the country. China has a massive audience, but you have to follow some rules before you can make money from them. This is a great example of using bureaucratic bars for influence. To get your film played in China, it doesn't matter whether or not everyone along the greasy pole can make a lot of cash, although I suspect they'd prefer that, it has to be approved. There's no rating board, a film must be suitable for everyone. They better not have ghost stuff, they better keep their pants on, no passing the duchy. Here's a summary of Article 25 of the Chinese film regulations. There's a link in the description. It's a real nail-biter. As you can see, the first three points are devoted to protecting the state. Don't oppose the constitution, don't oppose the state. But later, we see that any film won't be allowed if it encourages superstition, or propagates obscenity, gambling, or violence. Also, films can't insult or slander others, or jeopardise social ethics, or fine national cultural traditions. Honestly, what's the point in making a film if it doesn't do any of those things? Basically, this set of rules means that the censor can reject anything. It's deliberately very broad and very ill-defined. There's no skirting, there's no arguing. To get your film played in China, it better be China-friendly. With such a huge audience, this inevitably influences what foreign films can contain and be about. Do you want your film to contain a true but negative comment on China? Do you want it to have a gay romance or be about guga ghosts? Or do you want to have access to the second largest market in the world? Even films that don't explicitly break censorship rules can be barred. See anything on here about sexuality? Yet Brokeback Mountain was barred from screening in 2006, 
as was Call Me By Your Name in 2018. Following the written rules isn't enough. The Chinese censor has to want a film. For foreign films trying to get into China, this undoubtedly influences them from pre-script to the final sound mix. We've all seen and heard films that have been changed in the sound mix and in the dub to change locations and words for a Chinese audience. And it doesn't stop there. China uses a quota system that charges some foreign films a flat fee, others a take of revenue and others a combination of the two. And that isn't strange, but with its ever-changing bureaucracy, the quota system also encourages foreign film studios to partner with domestic studios by offering discounted rates, tax credits and friendly pats on the back, I guess. The quota and censorship rules provide a ceiling for foreign influence and make sure that Chinese-made films are most of those consumed. It's part of a bureaucracy that serves as a mechanism for total control over the cinema diet. All of this is only how China influences by restricting what it imports. It also influences through exportation, although this is a far greater challenge for any authority. Listen to this political analyst on state-run CGTN talking about exporting what he calls the Chinese experience. We are ready to share our experience, our wisdom with the other people. China is open and China is also magnanimous towards other political parties, other countries. What he's talking about is exporting China as an idea or perhaps more specifically, as a brand. In the same way that Japan has been exported to the West as being clean and modern and technological, or Britain has been exported to America as being quaint and queer and with a dog turd on every paving stone. And it's not wrong. But unlike those brand exportations of Britain and Japan, which are for tourist purposes and sort of fun, China is seeking it to enable exportation without resistance. Forget about the human rights violations, forget about the hiss in the microphone. We are here, we are dignified, and we have a lot of plastic to sell. Co-productions are the film wing's effort of the propaganda ministry to export messaging. The efficacy isn't clear, but I think the intention is. We're the same. I was given to an army before I can remember. As a soldier? Worse. For your country? No. I fought for food. You live long enough, you fight for money. How many flags do you fight for? Many flags. We are not the same. Xinren. Xinren means trust. To have faith, we fight for more than food or money. We give our lives to something more. You know, there's a sequence in the Russian sci-fi film Solaris where the protagonist is driving on a highway. It features this shot, which you may notice is a composite. Despite the terrible quality of the copy I've got, the building on the right is a mirror of the one that's in the middle. The in and out ramps go nowhere. It's meant to be in Russia, but that isn't Russian. That's because the sequence was filmed in Tokyo. The filmmakers needed to go there because nowhere in Russia looked like that. Kind of futuristic for 1972. But I think the decision to shoot the sequence wasn't just logistical. I think state image was part of it too. Solaris is a beautiful film, but it had to be authorised by the state. And I can't say for sure, but I think that some of the reason for filming in Tokyo wasn't simply logistical. I think part of it was to make the Russian state look a bit more sophisticated. And I bring this up not to wattle on about Solaris, but because I get exactly the same feeling when I watch The Meg or The Great Wall. Solaris's reason for existing was never primarily as propaganda, but it does serve as propaganda. And I think that you could argue that all art and media, even if unintentionally, can serve as propaganda. Here, I'm trying to be fair but I am coming at things from a Western-centric point of view, inevitably. And I'm also coming at things from the point of view that authoritarianism is undesirable. That is an assumption. All art and non-art is created by people whose beliefs, assumptions 
or lack of those things inevitably seeps through. In these big budget films from China, however, it's more than incidental, and it's certainly more than in Tarkovsky's work. It feels to me as though these films, unlike Solaris, that are made with a foreign audience in mind, are little more than commercials. Both are about Chinese and American cooperation, and the Meg almost screams, we're capitalists too. The propaganda in both films isn't as overt as a shot of the great leader or a wailing monologue, but it is recurring, and it is throughout. Call me bald, but I'm pretty sure that the arc of the main character in The Great Wall is that he learns to trust the Chinese. Trust in each other. In all ways. At all times. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm not jumping. I'm alive today because I trust no one. A man must learn to trust before he can be trusted. And you were right. We're not the same. Why did you go over the wall? Seen Ren? Did I say it right? See ya. Perhaps we were both wrong. We are more similar than I thought. And that's not to say that these things don't appear in films from elsewhere. And it's not to say that films with pro-Chinese sentiment, or films that have been approved by a censor, aren't any good. These films aren't any good because of their milquetoast scripts and their lame execution. What it means is Chinese propaganda is now part of Western film because of the consent of the Western film industry. I'm not calling anyone in Hollywood a commie or anything like that. No, it's all for the almighty dollar. And any danger of a flood of bad Sino-American movies has now subsided. Because while China will always have an enormous influence by virtue of having an enormous market, I genuinely feel as though the audience for watching other state state films is quite small. Over the last decade, I've heard different Chinese executives talk about exporting Chinese stories, and that if there's an international appetite for American stories, there's probably an international appetite for Chinese stories, and things like that. Now about the boost in the cultural industry. Culture is the pillar of the national economy in, in, in China. Uh, under the five-year plan, the recent five-year plan of China is specifically indicated that uh, this industry as a whole has to grow 20% per year. And that's the wrong way to look at it, and I think it shows a real disconnect between business think and reality. If you look at what's coming out of America, even if you look at what's coming out of Hollywood, there is enormous range. There are movies that celebrate the troops and the glory of the flag, but there's also real dissension. Dissension is a part of free art. Dissent of everything, including dissension itself, is critical for real art to thrive. There are documentaries about corruption, narrative films questioning the status quo, simply movies that aren't just disposable entertainment, movies that don't do what Uncle Sam says and don't need to worry about it, films that don't need approval. I think the potential for Chinese export is limited so long as the Chinese film industry is state controlled. Sure, people will go and see some big spectacle and maybe they'll pick up on the sentiment that hey, China's not so bad, they're different, but not so different. No one who watches movies more attentively than watching a movie while driving wants to see propaganda, and it's wrong to assume that general audiences are stupid. People who aren't interested in films can still see propaganda, especially when they're not exposed to it all the time, and especially when it's as heavy-handed as this. Ultimately, however, I think the Chinese film industry has made a strategic error. Things like Hero might have been a good start, but The Great Wall and The Meg are so focused on being instantly consumable, I think they jettisoned much chance of having a meaningful impact. Don't get me wrong, money is important to the regime, and both films made money. Although the Meg is more subtle, its tone is deliberate. It might not repeat the word trust a dozen times, and might not seemingly be about that, but a message, a pro-Chinese message, from the Chinese government, is there. As industry products, 
these two films made money. But as propaganda, I mean cultural exchange through art, I think The Meg and The Great Wall miss. A sincere, well thought out film about something meaningful, possibly about a common experience, possibly something like the Second World War, might have got messaging across much better. The first film that Zhang Yimou directed was just that, and I genuinely think a film like that, that the censors let tell a story of triumph over adversity and authority, would have made China look far more grown up and respectable than this. That leads me to say that there are good and bad films from China, just like anywhere. Propaganda doesn't necessarily make a bad film. There can be films that are propaganda but are still works of art, although it seems harder and harder for Chinese filmmakers to make them. I think in the long term, China will struggle to maintain its cultural foothold in the US box office. I think in the long term, they probably won't try. I very much doubt the efficacy of influencing general audiences. I'd have sort of thought subtle propaganda in Indian art films would be the way to go, maybe even describing them as a grassroots thing. But I think I might be giving away my own big book of evil. China will always have people who will bow down and change their products. They'll always have their quotas and their rules. They can influence the international market this way, but so far influence through export doesn't seem a winner. The only way China will ever dominate film is if it stops censoring artists and if it allows filmmakers to make the films that they want to make, not the films that a board of people wants them to make. I know this was an especially dry video, so next time I'll do the George gender reveal. With sexy results. Thanks very much for watching. Zai Jian. Oh, and I've got a website. <laughs> Chu the Juda Shirchan Shirdu the Shoku